The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, great. So I think it's about time to get started. So good afternoon. So uh, let me see. Uh, so what do you think about Genko? Or Genko, I guess. Genko, Genko? I never know. It's a good talk. I enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, it was interesting. So let's talk about the, uh, just to kind of refresh our memory, and then we move into the two more things I want to cover today. We want to cover um, the uh, Whirlpool case study, kind of a, to close this notion of reverse logistics and closed loop supply chains a little bit. Uh, but before we start, we read a, a quick case study on Recellular uh, that was really tried to connect with some of the things that we heard from, from, from Genko. Genko? Genko. And I wanted to know, I read the, the, uh, the responses, the homeworks, and you were split. So some of you did think that Recellular had a future, and others thought that they were deemed to disappear as a company. So who wants to be the voice of uh, Recellular? Well, before we start, uh, well, since this is your first time I see you here, yeah. so uh, I know you were traveling. So do you remember what is the basic business model of Recellular? Yeah, I did. I did read the case yeah. study. I also organized for it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all okay. great. So why don't you give us a quick recap of what Recellular does? Just in 10 minutes or less. They are uh, getting minutes, cell phones and repurposing them and yeah. selling them to other markets, uh, markets that you know may think those sell, that still uh, give a certain value for those uh, secondhand cell phones. Mm -hmm. And they get them from various sources, uh, mm -hmm. including the donation bin type sources, uh, as well as uh, uh, some higher quality sources. Okay. Yeah. Great. So uh, who else was in favor or thought that the recellular model had some future? Four. So who wants to, Mariana, you want to try to do it? Sure. Give um, your pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, my sales pitch to December. I think they have a future because uh, people will always consume cell phones. They might evolve into something else, like they have, we have seen it, like it's, they will become tablets or something. But that same instrument to talk and, and surf the web, and what we're doing now with phones, will evolve, and they can tap into the industry. It might not be cell phones. But it would be something else, and they can tap into that innovation as long as they keep up with it. Which I think, by them going to the e-commerce, gives them a good sign that management is doing a good job on keeping up with technology and making it, keeping it global. So I think that's why I see a good future. What do you think is the biggest uh, bottleneck of reseller? Uh, the fast evolution of equipment and the technology is a thing. The other one is the, as they say, the standards are not the same in all countries. Mm -hmm. However, the fact that they have different markets in these countries also work in their advantage. For example, I'm in Latin America. You get equipment that is refurbished, and it doesn't, you don't, doesn't care. It's just you have the technology in hand. And I'm sure it's the same in third develop, in developing countries. And I see that as working the same advantage as well. OK, great. So someone that uh, doesn't think reseller has a, a chance. I just think that their current business model of getting donated cell phones wasn't viable because, it, you know, there was a time when, you know, people usually got their cell phone for free and then, you know, after two years and they got another one for free and they said, okay, I don't need this anymore and they throw in a donation. But now people pay a lot of money for their cell phone and they want some of that value back or they still see the value at the end. So they have to shift their model to something where maybe they're actually paying you at a discount rate for someone's old cell phone, which you see now, like, you can see your own career. Yes. Uh, we cannot hear anything at all from here. From uh, you can hear me, but nobody else. Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, we cannot hear anybody else. So, uh, Michael, could you uh, help us with the uh, uh, mics? I'll try to repeat in a sec, but keep going then, please. So I think they have, to, they have to shift towards basically, you know, purchasing these phones on people, not relying so much off the third-party collectors if they want to remain viable. So, your main concern is that the shifting. Um, uh, business model on cell phones or electronics that you're paying for them yeah. that you don't want to donate it anymore and that's kind of the main way how Recellular is trying to make money is by exactly. getting them donated yes. and uh, trying to make money out of that donation yes. 
So basically, you're arguing that there may not be enough residual value to buy a phone because they could pay a little bit for it, right? Yeah, and then they will work. They can't rely so much as getting it from the third party collectors. That's but you, you think if they pay for it, will that make them viable? Yes. Okay, somebody doesn't, doesn't agree? Um, so just to build on the point of, I don't think it'll. It'll I'm checking to see if they can see it. Can they? Uh, can you hear it now or the same as bad? Can you hear better? Yeah, Okay. Okay. Hey. Um, so I think the business model was more viable at the beginning where the cellular industry was starting and product lifetime like was sh a much longer. But now you have new models coming all the time and that significantly decreases the price that you can get for a second-hand phone. Um, so for example, previously maybe you had, I don't know, 50 models of cell phones come out in a year, and now you might have 200. I don't know, I'm making the numbers up, but you do have much more, more offers right now. So the price you can get is pretty, uh, I think it'll decline, and as a result, you'll have less revenue. So I don't think that it's so viable. Okay. I think uh, to, to add on to the point, uh, right now, I mean, we're talking about enough, almost like one-to-one -one ratio of cell phones and people on Earth. So we're talking about large manufacturing volumes, which means that the, the, co the price uh, has also decreased. So that would decrease the, the attractiveness of second-hand phones. And also, I mean, that differential that reseller is trying to play on, how much they buy the phones as compared to how much they can sell the phones. So is the shrinking margins that you think are going to be a problem? Do you want to go back and say, why reseller can still make money? Yes. <laughs> and uh, I would like to the points that were raised. I think one first thing uh, about the prices, I don't think that the price is going down is bad for the, for the customer perspective. And what I use is the um, technology lifecycle model. So there are a lot of innovation, and, and there are other adopters in the early majority, but they're also laggards and people who are not adopting the technology or not technology oriented and who are just really happy to have very low price phone because they value more like the, the price rather than the technology. And so there's at least one third or more of the market that is actually asking for the secondary phones because they don't value as much the technology and, and they have just more choice because there are a lot of different phones actually that are on, being um, on, put on the market and then the innovation goes. So those people have actually a largest choice for like um, a lower price and from a customer perspective and from a demand standpoint, I think this is um, a good thing. And so the business model might have to change a little bit because they will have lower margins or so, but they have demand. So if they do the right adjustments and play on volumes and play up on quality and play on um, that the, the quality of phone um, offers, I think there's really a way to make that way through the secondary market. So, so the argument here is that even though the margins could shrink over time, there's always, in, in adoption of any technology, there's always laggards. So there's always a market, basically. Yeah. The question is, uh, uh, well, you probably have to be more efficient. Or, or, uh, so the I, part of the argument is they are the first. If you're among the first, you can probably get scale, and you can be more competitive. I don't know. Part of my reason for thinking they're not going to last is that they do one and only one thing. And we find all the time that companies who do one thing don't survive when the next disruptive technology comes along. I guess what I'm saying is I disagree with the fundamental assumption that they, people will always have cell phones. That's what we said about horses. That's what we said about newspapers. <laughs> Things go away. <laughs> I said that they would evolve. Yeah, so, so maybe there, there is the electronics, so they, they need to uh, add something else, yeah? And also, um, as they scale up, they can become more global in emerging countries. The cell phones are still like a large um, market to penetrate. And we can see that with mobile payments, people are like just buying phones and they're really, they're accessing ways to, to pay for those phones because it's also less expensive and less expensive. So even if we at some point in the future don't have phones anymore, um, they can still in the meantime sell to other people and what I think is that they can adapt and if they, if you don't have phones at one point and you have something else, then they can 
sell secondary something else mm -hmm. to people afterwards. So this mechanism still goes on. Okay. So let's uh, just check with our uh, friends from Saragossa. So do you hear any of that discussion? Yeah, we, we heard uh, par part of it. So so Okay. It's okay. Okay, Thanks. good. Just want to double check. All right. So, um, so here's the challenge, right? So we, I, I am hopeful that uh, Recellular can survive, or one way or the other. But the the question is, what happens when Recellular does not survive? If there's not a business uh, to be made, so what will happen with those phones? Jenko will get them, yeah. <laughs> so, so, the, uh, we, so we heard that the difference is reseller is a specialized, very niche, uh, reverse logistics provider. Uh, Jenko was, you know, completely diversified. So they take anything that their customers want. In this case, the customers is the retailers. The customers is not us. Uh, so I think that that's a, what I, many of you pointed out, that one of the big differences is uh, Jenko's business model is more towards uh, partnership with the retailers. Really, that's their customer. Hmm? Um, they are, um, reseller, on the other hand, wants to go to the end consumer hmm? and wants to get us more engaged one way or the other. Of course, more, most of their purchases come from dealers, hmm? so they have another, another, um, another option, and they're trying to grow to end consumers to try to penetrate the market more. But it, it's, it's, a challenging, it's a challenging environment, uh, which gets us to Whirlpool. Whirlpool, Whirlpool, Whirlpool. So what do we do with Whirlpool? Um, so the way I would like to start, uh, well, any, any other c comments? I cannot, I'm not sure if they're going to survive or not. But Every time I fly to Brazil, I can pay for my ticket by reselling the cell phone that's in my pocket. <laughs> there's definitely a future for reselling. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully there's enough market, and, and I, I believe there's enough, but you know, there's lots of pressures. To be honest, as it becomes, the margin is lower and lower. Who knows? Hmm? When that was oh, this uh, this case was uh, five years ago or so, so it's a little bit older. So reseller is still around. I don't know how good how good are they right now, thriving or not. Um, okay, good. So uh, let's let's go to Whirlpool. Unless there's any other co co closing comments or questions about reseller or Jenko, Saragossa, any comments or questions? Final thoughts? No. Yeah. Okay, remember, Thanks. wave the hands, otherwise okay. I, cannot, I cannot see you. All right, um, so let's go to uh, Whirlpool, and to do Whirlpool, we're going to spend a little bit more time on it, and um, what we will start with is, who wants to tell me what should Whirlpool do? So what, which are the choices of Whirlpool? Let's start with you. Are to go with the IFO model. Yeah. Can you explain uh, what IFO is quickly? So, the IFO is, is an industry funded organization um, in which, uh, so it's, it's, what I understand is it's kind of like a third party that kind of collects, you know, it is formed by all the industry players and they collect the, the appliances and they, you know, they deal with it properly. Yeah. So, we put it in other words like Jenko, but funded by a bunch of same industry players. Right? Yeah. And they all pay Jenko and Jenko does everything. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Mm -hmm. The other way is the second method is for um, for Whirlpool to be an iPhone on its own, right? To run a closed loop system and collect their own appliances at the end of life. Closed loop, yeah. closed loop system. Um, so in in this context, and we probably have not defined closed loop properly. It's just the same company that uh, sells the product wants to get it back hmm? and try to keep it within your own system as opposed to uh, getting somebody else to deal with it and take care of it. And you want to somehow extract value out of that process and bring those materials back into your same supply chain as best as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what the option, and this closed loop is closed loop doing it alone. A little bit alone, at least in Canada, right? They're doing it by, why will they even? There's a third option, which, which is to do nothing. Ah. Third option, of course. Right. Right. Yes. More than do nothing. Do nothing is no longer an option. Do nothing was an option maybe in 2005 for these guys. Yeah, so, yeah I know. I, I know what you meant, yeah. So third, third option is to oppose the regulation. Oppose the regulation. So let me start doing with a little show of hands. How many people think that they should go with the industry-funded option? 
Sorry, goes one, two. Anyone there? <coughs> two two. I, I will add enough. Two and a half there. Well, you don't know halves here. I'm doing a point of three and then one. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. So if it doesn't work, okay. Two. How many would like to oppose regulation? <laughs> one, two, three. I don't see. It looks like there's the three. So I take the rest of you would like to do it on your own, right? So let's start with the. So you were who else was opposing regulation? Why would you oppose regulation? Uh, well, can I also qualify to say if I had to do one or two, I would pick two. Yeah. But the the idea was that that it's not really going to be helpful because a lot of this process is self-sufficient to begin with. I think they said like 95% of all of the used products go into the recycling process and hardly any of it um, goes into landfill just because there's a lot of commodities that are in these products like aluminum or aluminum or the, <laughs> uh, copper or stuff like that. So all this stuff gets reclaimed so you don't need to do something that's going to add a lot of overhead to people's businesses to have them do something that is pretty much already happening on its own. So it happens on its own. What, what were the rates? Someone remembers of recycling? It's like 95 to 99 percent. It's pretty good, right? <laughs> Those were world girls numbers. So that oh, they're pretty. They're pretty consistent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's trust them. Let's trust them. These are factual numbers. So 95 percent of it is kind of being naturally repurposed, recycled in some way or another through a normal network. Going back to, we're discussing all the different products, cars and t-shirts. Uh, cars have a lot of value, appliances have a lot of value. They're designed for a very, very long time. So someone wants to kind of move that chain of how much you value having the latest, latest model of refrigerator or not. And eventually when he goes to the bottom of that chain, that person also wants to maybe make the effort to to try to get some value, and a dealer gets in and scraps it and divides it into all the metals and eventually gets done. Hmm? I would argue it's more of an effort for someone to not recycle their old washing machine, to like pick it up and take it to landfill. It's not like they're throwing away batteries. Like, I mean, <laughs> most people get rid of their stuff by putting it outside in front of their house and then someone picks it up. So if the process already works, like those 5% that aren't recycling it or whatever, they're probably not going to just because Whirlpool came up with a closed loop system, so it's really not going to add any. So those 5% have their own landfill, so they will still they trash it, yeah? It okay. <laughs> <laughs> They'll leave it there hanging. Those are the ones that are not accounted for, right? Those are the ones that are still in your house's uh, landfill somewhere. Okay, good. So uh, why is, yeah, you want to add something else? On the yeah, I just want to comment. I think that the problem with that, even though it seems to be working, is like, perpetuates the mentality that I can just put something out on my, you know, on my driveway or on the sidewalk and someone else is going to take care of it. And I think that's a big issue in the U.S. at least for So this is uh, the, the, the working part is that it, not sure the market is, but there's something about the overall social norms changes that you would like to maybe to. So this is part of a trend, right? So it's Canada, right? We're talking about the U.S. here. It's Canada, so people are very conscious. They are already doing lots of recycling. There's lots of other programs going on. Huh? So this is natural progression. Hmm? But um, a couple of people that maybe who, who thought that the, uh, the why regulation is still not enough. So the one reason is social. Which is the other reason? For now, the, the prices of all the commodities are pretty high, but what happens is at some point the prices are not high enough to give incentives to recycle. So that was the second point. And also there are some uh, new regulations that are coming up that we come up because uh, we uh, figure out that uh, well, they had this example about mercury, that they need, they need to regulate mercury, how uh, we did that with mercury. Um, how will we show that all the scavengers uh, deal with uh, uh, with some of the material correctly? Um, so that was another question. Yeah, refrigerant, for example. Refrigerant, yeah. refrigerant. So there's a couple of things that uh, we know that they are recycled. Uh, we know that those materials are being somehow repurposed. A big chunk of them. So the problem is that if the prices change, boom, this, this market will collapse. Maybe there's innovation in materials. And they come with a new material that is an alloy, 
plastic, who knows, that is still as good performing as they need for the structure of the refrigerator, that is not as recyclable or is very expensive, and then you have mu much higher waste. So there's a little bit of an uncertainty factor. Then um, uh, clearly what they're trying to get out of it, what is the most value and what they know how to deal with. And mercury and refrigerants are a little bit more tricky. And it's unclear to know if, um, if they're doing pr properly. So there's a little bit of a tricky part there. But there may be other options of regulation instead of this one. So this is, this is the, the regulation that they are opposing is the, the uh, extended pro pro producer responsibility, the EPR responsibility. That is, Whirlpool needs to be responsible for the whole thing. But there are other things that they could do uh, just to tackle mercury and refrigerant, for example. What could they do if they only want to fix that problem? What, will the government, what could the government do without doing this whole very complicated process? They're doing the laptops, they just, they just banned the product or banned the, the hazardous material out of it. So, some pieces you can ask the manufacturers to phase this out of their products mm -hmm. altogether, right? So, you work with the manufacturers and you do some sort of agreement, technology uh, path, and then eventually you can get rid of that. That's one option. Any other options? Saragossa, any other options? They're silent today. We, we have the mic off just uh, to make ah. sure we don't have ego. Yeah. So any other options? Should I say? No, no options. <laughs> the other one is to trade these dealers maybe, right? These current recyclers and train them to do better mercury management. We do a whole program, right, where you can just, instead of involving everyone, you just go to the market directly and do it. Those are a few things that you could do uh, instead of regulation. But let's move to the other two options. IFO versus closed loop. Who chose the IFO model? So, uh, no one in Saragossa, so maybe I'll give you a chance. So, why will the IFO model be a good chance for Whirlpool? Well, <coughs> I voted for that because that gives time and flexibility for the regulation to change. Uh, I said if you go with an IFO, it gives you more time to see how the infrastructure really works, how um, how they can look internally to see how the closed loop can be designed and actually done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I saw it more as a, as a temporary solution and then based, because it's, it's way more expensive, right? It would take like three, four times according to my calculation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the closed loop. So I said do it for a period of time and then once you change the closed loop, you can pay back and actually meet how the regulation will evolve during mm -hmm. that period of time. So this is like a good, safe place to start the process. Start and then move ahead either if the regulation changed or the closed loop turns out to be more effective than expected. All right. So what do you say about that? I haven't read the case. I'm still not on Stellar. So oh, you're still not on yeah, Stellar? My first class. Okay, okay. All right. So then. I said that you should go with the closed loop because I think assuming that you're going to have to get there eventually, even though it's large startup costs, putting the time in and getting the jump on it could make them a, a leader in this. Um, if they know they're going to go there and they already have started to make their machines more green, then they can stand to benefit from optimizing their processes and manufacturing for their system by continuing to pay for people who aren't. Um, as advanced as they are with their recycling technology. Mm -hmm. Adding to that, we also address uh, customer loyalty. Not only are you there when they start using your appliance, but you take care of their appliance when they don't no longer need it. So that could have a lot of impact in future mm -hmm. sales. I'm also supporting the closed loop because it's quite in the case that the corporate culture is very in-house and that they're used to doing their own things. So I thought that the closed loop might be like more, uh, more heavy in the industry, but it also matches the culture of the company better. And the industry model, they would basically suffer from partners who have a less green design and they would incur probably more difficulties of just going with their own. Okay, you want to defend your IFO choice? Um, so, 
basically why I chose IFO was assuming, so I worked under the assumption that legislation would pass soon. Yes, sure. Um, so assuming that legis legislation passed soon and that there are fines for not complying, if you go into closed loop, you would have to develop a logistic system that's really, that gets to every part of Canada, basically, which is a huge country, and uh, and you would need to make investments in, for example, vehicles to pick up the, the refrigerators and the ovens or uh, uh, the washing machines and all of this. Um, so I, I believe that this was too much of a cost to be, to effectively reach all of the customers that it has. Um, and that to, under the iPhone model, since it was something consolidated, you were taking advantage of the economies of scale of, well, you reach all the customers in all of Canada, but for not just 30% of the market, but for the entire 100% of the market. And you get the economies of scale for that, of that. So if I, if I may extend a little bit this argument is, well, I, I can make investment money in many, many places, right? I could invest them in better products. Mm -hmm. I can invest money in other places, so why should I put my money in developing this new network if I could just pull my resources with others and then try to make pay potentially less? We'll talk about the cost later. Yeah? Uh, and decide what happens. So you wanted to add something to that argument? Just thinking of economies of scale, if 95 to around 95 percent of the machines are currently not making their way to the landfill. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there's economies of scale to justify the upfront costs for a closed loop system. So yeah, so there, there's not even e enough uh, volume, even right, because people are naturally recycling. Ah, so here you have, you control the costs. Here, you may get scale, maybe, maybe, right? The scale is much more certain here. Here you control the cost more. Okay, great. So those are the options. And uh, it's hard to make a call here without some numbers. So who is brave enough to walk us through their calculations? on how much this thing costs for Whirlpool. Let's try to make a few estimates to see and try to make a decision, is this really more expensive or not? From an industry uh, a I IFO versus um, the closed loop. So what I'll do is uh, maybe someone is willing to risk and tell me how much is the cost per ton of doing an IFO model. Do you remember? I, I have the expressions here, so if someone can open it or your document, I would be happy to open it. So we see uh, how do you get to that number? Because those are the numbers you have to do eventually if you want to analyze the systems. So what is the uh, cost per ton, more or less, or per, or per pound? I'm not sure how you compute it to get these numbers. Let me get mine here. See more or less what they were. Someone remembers? How much money will this cost to Whirlpool? Total money, you remember? How many? 35 million bucks. 35 million dollars. Based on 2008. IFO? IFO, yeah. Um, but that's excluding the additional 20% of uh, right? Mm, that's based on the fact that there's 100 kilotons of the stuff uh, being thrown away. Yeah. And they own, 30% of it is Whirlpool. Yep. And then I found some data somewhere in a case study that had dollar per ton, and I applied the collection, transport, and processing numbers that were there. Yeah. So there was an exhibit that had all this cost per ton of collection, dollars, et cetera, et cetera, and you can apply that. Yeah. If you add it up, uh, that gives you roughly like $1,000 or something of the collection cost. Yeah, I assume mm -hmm. the most expensive route for the trucks and the full trucks as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that gave you like $35 million to do IFO. For 2008, yeah. For 2008 figures. I did something similar with average numbers and ended up same ballpark, 24 million. 24 million? 10 million more. <laughs> I will argue. But it's still, big, it's a big ballpark. It's a big number. <laughs> it's a big ballpark. Someone got a different number? So uh, that looks like a, like a big number, but how big is it? 
compared to what it will cost? It's tiny. They spend two hundred two million dollars to ship the stuff out to customers. How much they spend? Two hundred. Well, how do you get that number? Two hundred twenty million. Uh, other assumptions. Uh, I assume forty dollars yeah, for appliance delivery. And how, how much was it? Forty dollars. Forty dollars for, $40 for appliance delivery. Yeah. And five million appliances, large appliances shipped in 2008. Okay. Uh, mind you, uh, that's I didn't take the 30 percent of that number, so it'll be 30 percent of 102 million, so about 70 million. Uh, around 70 million for um, for, for long. We'll talk a little bit about this number in a second. I'll give you some. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. It was yeah. Not right. That number is born on the customer in terms of a delivery fee. Yeah. Uh, it so says that it accounts for the costs. So, but it is by it is the customer does pay for it. You're right. The so delivery fee right now for the retailer, but this is the, the collection fee. Yeah? So, yeah, but I'm just saying, like right now, like they haven't. It's paid for. Their cost for delivery isn't really a cost to them because they're probably making money off the delivery. You know, they're probably charging more than it actually costs. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just deferred. Yeah. 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 So it's it's. Uh, so. Uh, um, to be able to make this choice, we have to make these calculations right. So it, the number I got, no, although. Yeah, <laughs> the numbers uh, I have are more towards the 35 million, but for 2020 numbers, okay. not 2008 numbers. Uh, why 2020? Remember, remember that in some way you only see things that are discarded. The things that are kind of naturally progress from one place to the other, you don't see those. The uh, Whirlpool case had a table somewhere, Exhibit 7, and this gives you a sense of units discarded in 2020. So those are the total uh, discarded units of different kinds of appliances. So you can get their uh, refrigerators, freezers, dishwashers, cooking ranges, clothes and washers and so forth. Yeah? Um, then there's a table, I think, uh, on top that has uh, more or less the amount of uh, uh, steel, aluminum, copper, etc., and the weight of each, of each appliance. So you can get the total number of appliances times the weight of those appliances. And that gives you how many tons you have to, let's say, get back. Once you can put those tons you need to get back, um, those are not all yours, right? You only are responsible for your market share. Uh, you said 30%, but actually Whirlpool does Whirlpool and Kenmore. So it's close to 48%, more or less, of the market. 48% uh, of the market share. And then um, you get those numbers, and that's a total tonnage. Some of it you sell, you make money out of it. Because you can sell it, right? You get it, and you get mo make money out of it. And then you pay, um, and that's the, the tricky part. There's a collection cost on Exhibit 4. It's a collection per ton. That's come from the previous program, the WE program. And it says roughly, you know, in the WE program, there's an IFO program. It gives you $165 to collect per ton. And you can then add up all those numbers, and it gives you $37 million. I'll, I'll put a table, but it's a, that those are more or less the rough numbers that you get. And that gives you $37 million for um, the cost for doing this, which translates into a $47 per unit, more or less. So the cost of IFO is equal to 47 per unit uh, sold. 47 per unit. How does that compare to their distribution cost? That's how we know if it's expensive or not. How do you compute the distribution cost of Whirlpool? Someone did that? So you, we know more or less how to compare how, to how they do it. That's the reverse part, 47 per unit. Mm. So if I heard it different, so I did do it with 30% of market share, not 48%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they said that it's approximate for the industry standard 10% of their sales. Yep. Um, and so I was saying that they were selling two million four hundred thousand units, but that's thirty percent of the market. Let me change it to forty-eight. Yeah, but that's the right number. So the, the approximately the costs are ten percent. Yeah. So changing. Exactly. 
So now like, there's just another number somewhere in the case is $1,000 per unit. That's the average retail price. Now, you can, you can also assume a margin you know, of a retailer, 30% margin, 25% margin is not uncommon for these kind of appliances. So that gives you $700 more or less per the cost of the, of the goods. So the forward supply chain of Whirlpool is more or less $72. Forward supply chain. So it gives like $70, $70 less per unit. So it's 10% average sales price, $1,000. 30% margin, let's suppose, of a retailer that give us $700 is the cost of Whirlpool of those 10% are distribution costs. So it gives $70 per unit. Now, uh, the IFO cost here, this cost includes selling the scrap metals and recovering all the value of those metals. If you, if you get that out, this costs you $80 per unit. If you just look at the direct costs, you know, of recovering all this, all this material. I just want to have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so for the Whirlpool forward supply chain, that's the 10% of the cost, but that is usually bringing it to the retailer, right? Exactly. So Absolutely. should we consider the, the fee that is charged to customers to get it to their home? Because for the reverse supply chain, we kind of would have to pick them up from the home, right? So uh, we, we can talk about the network design. I just want to, yeah, let's talk about the options to try to get this cost. But to get started, these are the two numbers we need to compare. So $70 per unit is the cost to get into the dealer, to the retailer, sorry, or the dealer of the, of the appliance. $70 per unit. Uh, to get it back without getting a scrap is $80 per unit. Who, what, why is this higher, you know, compared to this one? Centralized distribution, right? It's just my network is not designed to collect stuff. Mm -hmm. So since it's not designed to collect stuff, the IFO model, even if it's the IFO model, Whirlpool is very specialized in forward. But these numbers, even the rough numbers, this is the kind of, of environment that you face the first time you go into any reverse logistics cost. That maybe the numbers are not that big when you look at the whole Whirlpool corporation, but when you start looking back and try to nail down and compute your distribution costs, this is the more or less situation you will face the first time around. Uh, your forward costs per unit are 70. Your reverse could be higher than that, uh, mainly because you are not using an optimized, well-designed network, hmm? which get us to the different options that we have to make these $80 down. So goes back to now we can put a little bit more, let's say, meat to this. So if the IFO model, assuming our estimates are okay, um, costs us roughly 80 per unit, and this one costs us roughly uh, 70 per unit. So if the IFO gets super efficient, and it really costs me much less, well, actually it doesn't cost me really 80 per unit. It cost me uh, 47, but I can also do it here and then sell the scraps. That's why I'm, com I'm computing this <coughs> one to the other. Hmm? So if, if the IFO pure distribution costs get down to much lower than 70, right, maybe it's worth doing it with them. So if, if, if they can get to the scale, and once they recover the investments, hmm, that uh, they have the plan, if this number gets less than 70, maybe it's worth for me to jump there. Hmm? Uh, on a cost, pure cost perspective. On the other hand, we have some of the other options here that will give me value. So with that, let me just ask, how will a closed loop, how do we want to compare the actual networks to see how different they are? The, the IFO versus the closed loop network of Whirlpool. So who wants to draw a diagram of how do you think a Whirlpool closed loop supply chain could look like? Someone volunteers? I'll volunteer someone. How is the current supply chain working? Go for it. You can use that one. And let's go back to where is the retailer, where is the dealer, and so forth. Give it a shot. So, forward supply chain, you have one or, one or two factories where they make the stuff. Yep. You go to 
series of regional distribution centers, and each of these in turn goes to a series of retailers. Sure. So uh, there's actually how many factories this Whirlpool has? No one remembers? Just in the case. I think it was 17 in total. Oh, but for Canada. For Canada, for Canada yeah. So 17 factories up, up there. And those go to how many DCs do they have in Canada? Someone remembers, more or less? 30, 40, 24. 24 DCs. 24 DCs. And how many retailers? Thousand? How about 2,400? 2,400 retailers. So that's the network. 17 factories, 24 retail distribution centers, 2,400 uh, retailers. Thank you. Thank you for being brave. Great. So, uh, how is the how will be an IFO model look like? If I join an IFO, what will happen? So let me just do a little uh, change to this so we can add more models. So we have a factory here. And this will go to our regional distribution center, right? And then this goes to a bunch of different retailers. The same diagram, so but we can just grow on this side. So what happens if we decide to join an IFO model? If someone comes with a with an IFO model, what will happen at this point with the with the goods? Will I collect them at the customer side? So do you think the industry, the IFO, what is extended producer responsibility? So what, what, walk me through, what, what does it mean? That I have to be collecting it or I have to give options to dispose? What does the legislation say more or less, or at least the way it's described here? that you're responsible for the ultimate disposal of the product. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't say that you know you have to go to your house and pick it up, right? Probably is not exactly the way it will work. Well, the way it will work is that you will set up some sort of mechanism to get those goods back. And that once they get back, you are responsible for properly disposing them. And you have to create all the right uh, information, material, and incentives for the consumers to know where and how to dispose these materials. It's like batteries. Talking about refrigerators and whatnot, I think the only practical way to do it is to go get them for them. Maybe they have to call and make an appointment several weeks exactly. after. But exactly. So, yeah, so but, but it will not be Whirlpool in an IFO model. More or less, the way you will do it is that you will probably get the uh, retailers or another network of dealers, probably. That's the way you will do it. That's the way it works probably today. You have a bunch of dealers here. And then these dealers are the ones that go to some sort of processor, some entity here. That deals with steel, or sorry, that deals with uh, decompo uh, decomposing the uh, uh, final, you get the raw materials hmm. out of here, hmm. out of the process. So that's more or less how the supply chain will look like if you do some sort of uh, of, of IFO model. Hmm. As someone pointed out, one of the things that you are missing out is that you are losing that connection with the consumer, and that's why I wanted to draw that diagram. Hmm. So if you go through an IFO model, you will effectively uh, 
remove your connection with the dealers. Maybe you want to do that on, on that network. Your consumer will not have that. Uh, let's, let's talk about practical reasons. Somebody mentioned this will cost some money uh, to be able to collect those goods from the house of the consumer to the dealer. How will you recover this money? How, how, what happens today? That's exactly the way it works. Right? All of us are paying for this, we just do not know. So when there is a realization like this uh, in Europe, or even batteries in North America, we are paying, or, or bottles, or some sort of any kind of uh, mandated collection, we are being charged for it, we are, it's not itemized. And then what happens? What happens with those dealers? Do you, once you get them collected, hmm? the dealer says, I have a Whirlpool here. I take a picture of the Whirlpool. Well, I scan it. Hmm? I send it to Whirlpool, and Whirlpool give me the money they collected so I can get back my cost. That's how you pay these, these situations. You don't, you, you don't, so you don't go and charge the consumer for picking it up, but you say, well, when you're done, call one of these authorized dealers, 1-800 number, we'll pick it up for you on an appointment, and then the dealer goes and picks it up, and then the whole process continues. Hmm? That is probably the, the most uh, common way that this actually is implemented in practice. So who bears the cost ultimately is the consumer, hmm? is, uh, which creates an interesting dilemma, right? If I'm charging my consumer, can I compete on the price I charge my consumer? I can uh, pr uh, charge less. It goes back to loyalty and other opportunity to touch the customer. Once you think about the implementation of, this, of these programs, that is how uh, maybe start making sense to try to get into it because if I can charge less for this, I can actually sell my product for less money from the perspective of the consumer, maybe. I can try to do that. Um, how will the network look like if I use my, the, the closed loop? Now it becomes apparent. What I will ask my consumers is, whatever you purchase to computer, we will take it back. So I'm moving right now, so I have all these things that I buy uh, for my new place. And uh, I go to Ikea a lot this last weekend. I went a lot more times than I wanted to go. And there's this big heart with an open hand. Have you seen it? We'll take it back. Right, so no matter what you, what you buy, we will take it back. So um, you can tell your consumer the same. If you bought your refrigerator from this, uh, from Sears, right? Or from Kmart, or from Walmart, and it's a Whirlpool refrigerator, don't worry. You can bring it back when you're done with it. And we will take it for you. And in that opportunity, I can also use that money to give you a new refrigerator. So that's the concept of also engaging the consumer, where you, you, you go to the same retailer where you purchase the goods and return that uh, refrigerator, washer and dryer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The question is, how do you get it back from the retailers to the rest of your network? So one option is, which is what Genko does pretty much, is that you still keep that connection, but you can still have a separate network. And you have another network that goes back here, where you goes back to some sort of collector, where you aggregate some of these flows, and then you can get it back to a processing facility that can take care of it. This gives you the intimacy with the consumer without having to deal with the whole network. But in that case, you will not get the, the cost advantage. You will have probably higher costs than the IFO model has because you don't have enough volume. Uh, where you get the most value is if you somehow use the same flow, so the same trucks that collect and deliver your goods to the retailer, those are the same trucks you use. You don't have to create a new, a new set of trucks. Yeah. Hmm? They are, they're coming empty anyways, right? So why not bring them back? Uh, also, the return volume is not as high, so it's not 100% of, of the sales. So what is the, the, the main bottleneck then for this to work? If you want to use your re retailer and use your own trucks that come empty. Some problems you will find on this uh, approach. Retailers won't, I mean, it doesn't add to me, so why what? would I want to do it? So that's a big problem. Hmm? You get all this crap. I have to have it around in my warehouse or in my floor's place. I have to use a sales associate to try to uh, spend time with the customer, cons customer and make sure that it's something I should take. Any Whirlpool? So that's first barrier. What's the other barrier? 
That yeah. one you can fix. Maybe you can give them some incentives. Yeah, we'll probably mention a systems barrier. They are not able to trace us at serial number level, so yeah. figure out when these things exactly. are coming from that. Yeah. Th that's another another thing. Which is the other one? Who has ever uh, kept the box of your Whirlpool refrigerator? How do you move those things in a truck efficiently? Luckily, a, when you go, things are very nicely packed. Not only because they're beautiful for you, but also they're easier easier to handle. Hmm? Your pallet can no go to the bottom. You can put it on top of a pallet. Things do not stick out all over the places. The doors do not open and close. So just the packaging of this thing yeah, is meant to be moved. But once you return it, it's just a, it's just chaos. So that creates equipment tear. You know, eventually you have to more labor to put it on top of the. So all those things are the things that make it a little bit more expensive. But you can come up with some solutions, some sort of standard wrapping or something. Yeah. But those are the operational con constraints that will probably get it. Once you get to face that that problem and you get to your RDC, you have the same problem that the retailer has. And that's, you don't want to have all this crap in your, in your DC either. So you have to have another area of your DC so it doesn't interrupt the flow. So those are the operational constraints you have to face to set up your own network. And in some ways or another, uh, that's what makes the IFO interesting. So even though the cost could be high, all those little barriers require some really strong collaboration with all your partners. Uh, your, your retailers need to be on board. You have to give them some incentives, either on branding or market share, some sort of incentive for them to work with you. Otherwise, why will they work with you? And, and after that, you still have to work with all those physical barriers of actually moving used products back into where they need to be disposed. And those warehouses and DCs are not available. You need more investments, even if they're not huge capital investments. They are big barriers on operational investments. And that's why companies like Genco are, are very profitable, hmm? because they still can kind of deal with that complexity, and you don't have to think about it. In this case, Whirlpool has a big advantage, market share, right? 48% market share. So you, got, you have the scale that you need to work these details. And if you can somehow include the the value of the brand into this whole equation, that's where this becomes attractive. Operationally, it's a nightmare. It's better to send it to Genco. Once you get to a certain scale, like maybe Whirlpool has, that's when you can get into uh, making worthy investments, plus if you get connection to the customer, which I think is ultimately, just as a side note, what Whirlpool decided to do. Whirlpool, in this particular case, they actually decided to go towards the closed loop, but it was much more expensive than they thought. So it kind of was not, did not go that well for our manager, <laughs> at least the first trial. But on the plus side of that, if they, since they did go to it, they're probably the first ones, maybe, they, maybe they can become the IFO and everyone else can pay them to do it. Yes, that's exactly what I was thinking. The thinking was, well, maybe we can become the IFO. At the end of the day, the legislation says, we pick one organization to pick up every, everything. So if things are not working out, you could become the IFO. Hmm? So uh, Whirlpool, in this particular case, they did decide to, to try to close, close the loop. Um, and they actually talk, uh, well, not, not in Canada, but in general, they talk widely about these things, hmm? about how they are taking things back and as part of their value proposition. And they believe this is going to give them some long-term value. All right, so that was kind of the underlying Whirlpool. So this is the way... Um, the best data you can get is like the one was in this case study. <laughs> you can get rough numbers on how much it costs. You have to look at other initiatives, like the WE initiative in different places of the world. They publish these kind of numbers, price of steel, price of copper, estimate number of units, and roughly going those. Um, the mapping of the cost here uh, was uh, it's a little bit harder. You need to have the inside information, so you, that's why you use 10% in general. But this is how you probably can think through understanding what is the right trade-off. Uh, that's always a good benchmark. Try to compute how much it costs, forward versus reverse, and that gives you a, a, a sense of what it be. Don't be surprised it's twice as much, 30% as much, 40% more than your forward, because it's not optimized. And later it will become better. Volumes is here the key uh, to do that. And, and homogeneous um, products, like the case of Whirlpool, uh, their boxes, big ones were boxes, makes it more viable. For a retailer, that's why their Jenko starts with. You have shirts and toys and cell phones, everything in one bundle. Then there's little homogeneous. Maybe connecting to your forward supply chain is not as easy because the box is hard to fit in your truck. <laughs> uh, boxes like these ones are easier. All right. Uh, any, any other thoughts or comments on the Whirlpool case? 
Tony or Alexis, anything I should add? Great lecture? Okay, great. Let's keep going. So let's, now I want to talk about the final projects. So I want each of you to come here in front and quickly uh, tell the rest of the group what are you doing, which companies you pick, and that's what I ask for your two slides. Great. Did every, everyone found a nice green area in the website of your companies? We, with Alexis, we joke every time we look at companies, they all they say it's, it's in our values, right? It's, every, it's in our DNA. That's the word they use. It's in our DNA, yeah. So every single company or website is, makes the world should be a better place. So the other company is Inditex, Sara. Okay, so today I have lots of questions in the next class about how to compute carbon footprint of energy and stores and electricity. I think that's going to be something to understand well because I'm sure all your companies have that highlighted somehow. No? So are they uh, smoke and mirrors or they're doing the real deal, I guess? We have to have to see after, no pressure, Tony, but. Nobody has more questions. <laughs> <laughs> after your lecture. Great. So you know that Zaragoza, our center is actually in the same logistics park as SARA, uh, largest distribution center in Spain. So that's one reason why our partner center is in Zaragoza, partly uh, uh, co-located with the plaza that is the logistics activity zone of uh, Zaragoza, where the largest distribution center of SARA is to manage all the global operations. They also fly things around from there. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's uh, pick the next one. Um, any questions or comments before I move to the next group? Yeah? All right. Let me see. Yeah. So the next one is Hewlett Packard and Dell. So, uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to just highlight two between these two projects. So we look at, first, these two, the two pairs of companies have very different business models, right? And I think Sarah has one uh, fast fashion, you know, um, lots of designs per year. Uh, Dell goes direct to consumer. And I think that really has deep implications. I think both of you highlighted that's important. I also want to point out at least the state of the, both industries in terms of environmental practices. Um, electronics industry has moved together for a longer time, let's say. There's the WE directive in Europe, you know, that put electronics under scrutiny, so they're both under higher pressure. That's where maybe you see more of the same initiatives like take materials out of certain kind. Uh, it's outlawed in some countries, right? <laughs> so you have to do it because you have to do it. Like, uh, so there's a little bit of that on one end. Um, um, they also tend to be more... Um, they collaborate in other sectors, both the apparel industry and the electronics industry. They collaborate on social issues on apparel, you know, for labor. Um, so that brings them together in other forums. In electronics, they also get together for uh, technology designs um, to keep processors and, and speed. So uh, as you go into both of your cases, take a look at maybe there's some underlying themes that are common to the industry that have brought because of the industry, really. And but you as a consumer have no idea about these things, so you can, for you it looks like every company is doing the same, but it probably comes from some other force. So in both cases, uh, I know, especially the electronics, less the apparel, are, are more on that, on that bandwidth. So just keep that in mind. All right, good. Uh, let me see who's next. Uh, BMW. Yeah. So I think that this is interesting. Thank you. It's interesting to know that you know the, the company that started, let's say, the at least brand with the consumer hybrid <laughs> notion is not the top rated company. And you will imagine that uh, where the largest emissions are in a car is in their usage. So if you innovated there, why are you number one for the next 25 years? <laughs> but it looks like it's not. So I think that uh, it's interesting to to know that. Uh, I also did not mention much about the. Uh, uh, now, the life cycle aspect of it, is in both of these companies, it's uh, very different. And um, in textiles, uh, I, Tony, I don't remember in textiles or Alexis, the life cycle emissions are not in use, except if you consider water, um, energy use for washing your clothes. Hmm? Uh, that probably uh, dwarfs the other emissions, but do you remember, Tony, the life cycle emissions of, of apparel in general for Inditex? Yeah. If it's, if it's washed, if so it's don't washed. wash your clothes. Uh, <coughs> uh, the high, high efficiency. High efficiency, yeah. No, don't wash them. Uh, um, or use a solar, solar washer. washer that's what I was yeah. <laughs> so the, uh, 
but this again goes back into the life cycle and which pieces you control versus you don't control of their life cycle. But um, um, great, thank you. Uh, let's look at the other group. Philip Morris International. Okay, thank you. I just uh, um, want to add the, uh, there was this comment on do you work internally in your operations or you do um, offsets, plant trees, or and we'll talk a little bit about that over time. Hmm? But this is, um, I'm glad that the, one of the companies here highlighted offsets as one of the strategies they wanted to pursue. Um, let me see. Um, the other one is this one I skipped. So for next class, the case study is, po is, is ready. The carbon footprint case study. Yeah, it's been posted. It's pretty simple. So hopefully, uh, if there's any questions about you know what you're actually uh, the mechanics of doing the calculations, etc., you can email me directly. Uh, you know with those questions, but have that filled out and turned in. Uh, by Wednesday morning, because we'll, I'm going to collect some of the data from that, and we'll use that in the discussion uh, during class. Okay, and, and you have to do the numbers for that one. There's no way to escape it. There's a bunch of Excel spreadsheets you have to work on. It, it requires only basic multiplication. Yeah, 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 sure. Thank you again.